The circular flow of income. This is another flip lesson for Economics 3. The best way I can show you the flows that exist in any economy is to simplify it down by looking at only the householders and the firms to start with. There are four flows. The most obvious flow is the production of goods and services by firms to the household sector. That's what we call output. Now, householders need to pay for these goods and services, and that's a money flow going back to the firms. We also call that the expenditure flow, or as I'll show you later, it's called aggregate demand. Householders provide a whole range of resources for firms. Remember, land, labour, capital and enterprise. And these resources need to be paid for. In terms of the income flow, again, it's a monetary flow made up of wages, rent, profits, dividends and royalties. What happens in equilibrium in a two-sector economy? The output stream is equal to the expenditure stream is equal to the income stream. Now that's a really important concept to understand. So therefore, if there's a, th a thousand of income, then the output in terms of the, amount of the value of goods and services produced is a thousand and correspondingly the expenditure on those goods and services should also be a thousand. So it's really important to remember the output equals expenditure equals to income. Now these, lay, these uh, flows have also uh, been labelled by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Gross to domestic product is the output stream, gross national expenditure, the expenditure stream. Uh, the national income is the income stream and you notice that the economic symbol for income is Y and the resources flow is this last one which I'm not going to take that much notice of but all these are available from the Australian Bureau of Statistics to uh, check up on. Now let's just expand our um, simplified two sector economy Ignore that last bit. Looking at the, th the third sector to this economy when, you, when we introduce banks, there's a savings flow that comes from householders and then goes back from the banks to the firms in the investment stream. So money for investment is pulled by the savings that householders put in the banks. Now let's go one step further looking at the government sector. Now you know there's two sure things in life and one of those things is that you will be taxed quite happily by a present government. So taxes is a flow from the household sector to the government who then put it back into the income, the, the, uh, the flow stream by government spending on various things that they spend money on. Now the, the, the most realistic representation is to include the final sector, the international sector. We obviously are living in a very globalised world and we deal more and more on an international scale. So householders, they, when they buy goods and services from overseas destinations, we class that as imports. And similarly, when our businesses sell goods and services to overseas customers, they're classed as exports. So just to summarise, we've got five sectors We've got these flows initially, and then we've got these extra other, other flows. These are going out, and these are going in. But they've got special names. The one on the left here, the savings, taxes, and imports, are leakages from the money flow. And on the other side, investment, government spending, and exports are classed as injections, the amount that go back into the money flow. Now let's have a look at what happens in equilibrium. When savings plus taxes plus imports are equal to the investment plus government spending plus exports, the economy is in equilibrium. In other words, the leakages equal to the injections. What about when the leakages are more than the injections? Well, there's more money going out, therefore the economy shrinks. Conversely, when the leakages are less than the injections, the economy expands. Okay, we've covered an important part so far. I want you to stop, check your understanding on page 29 of text and do these following questions. You've got the opportunity obviously to rewind um, and go through it again if you need, but
please do these questions to consolidate before going on. What I want to do now is to give you an overall representation of the economy and I'm using a tank. You can see there's the tank, there's a tap, there's the level of economic activity. So we're going to track whether it goes up or down. Okay, injections. Remember, they increase economic activity and conversely, if there's more injections come into this uh, tank, the economic activity, the level of the water if you like, goes up. Now if we look at leakages, they decrease economic activity as I told you earlier, therefore we have the tank going down via this beautifully represented tap. To put the labels on it again, the injections made up by investment by firms, government spending by government, and exports by our firm sector, they all inject uh, money into our tank and savings, taxes, and imports provide our leakages which make our level of economic activity go down. So we need to have a working knowledge of injections and leakages and what impact they have on economic activity. So when we look at equilibrium again, uh, as I said to you before, in this case leakages are equal to injections. So when your equilibrium is reached, that's the case. But what about if leakages exceed injections? It means economic activity decreases, and as I said to you earlier, if the leakages are less, inje the injections exceed leakages, then economic activity increases. Now again, I'd like you to uh, take pause, go to page 29, there's an extended response on that page, and these these two things I want you to look at. I've basically been talking about how leakages and injections influence economic activity, but this is a bit of an extension for you. Examine how the government can influence the level of economic activity. And you can put that in historical context in relation to the last global financial crisis. Okay. Now I must talk to you about aggregate demand. It's a very important part of our um, expenditure flow that I talked to you about earlier. It is the total amount of goods and services demanded in an economy over a period of time. It's represented by consumption of goods and services by us, the consumers, investment into capital goods by firms, amount of government spending, exports earned by Australian businesses, and the imports and goods and services into Australia from overseas destinations. Now that's represented by this particular equation. Aggregate demand is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending plus exports but we've got to take away the imports. Now we also must talk about aggregate supply. There's the amount of goods and services produced by firms, and if you remember, that's the output flow. The, thing, the important thing to remember here is that aggregate supply always lags behind aggregate demand, and that's because of the consumer sovereignty principle. We decide what we want. Um, if we don't buy it, the stocks rise, then the suppliers get this message, OK, I must reduce production, and conversely, if, they, if the stocks of goods and services decrease, they will increase production. Now again, looking at equilibrium, when aggregate demand is equal to aggregate supply, equilibrium is reached. When aggregate demand is bigger than aggregate supply, the economy will grow. And similarly, the economy will shrink when aggregate demand is less than aggregate supply. Now what you should have learned so far is um, the two sector model and its associated flows, the fact that output flows equal to expenditure flows equal to the income flow, there's related Australian Bureau of Statistics labels to each one of these three flows, so the most important ones that we measure. You should know the sectors in the five circular flow model and its associated leakages and injections, how then equilibrium is established between leakages and injections and their corresponding impact on economic activity. You should know the all-important aggregate demand function and its relationship to aggregate supply, and also understand the basic e equilibrium that we talk about aggregate demand and aggregate supply. I hope that's been useful. There will be a follow-up lecture to do with aggregate demand aggregate supply analysis related to multiply that you'll do soon after this, but I'm hoping this has been useful to, for you, and thank you for listening.